program is pre-recorded. Just a couple of seconds past the top of the hour, it is time for East Bay Yesterday. You're listening to East Bay Yesterday. This show is about history, but it's not stuck in the past. Let's begin. Let's begin. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of East Bay Yesterday on KPFA. I'm Liam O'Donoghue. If you've been listening to this show for a while, you know how much I love Oakland. (laughs) But sometimes living here can be frustrating, to put it mildly. Just look around. Massive inequality, dangerous streets, pollution, corrupt cops, you get it. It didn't have to be like this. These problems at the institutional level, you can trace them back to bad decisions that were made by people who lived here before us. Throughout the 20th century, the vision of Oakland that most politicians and business leaders embraced It was a vision driven by greed and racism. The fact that when highways were being built, they plowed through black and brown neighborhoods, that was no accident. The same city leaders who made decisions like that, they didn't want affordable housing for quote unquote minorities or even poor whites. That's why they blocked proposals that would have built it. They didn't want commercial development that would serve working class people. Instead, They wanted to build fancy new malls downtown to attract big money shoppers from the suburbs. So for decades, that's what they focused on. This elitist and unrealistic vision was what they were trying to create. And to make downtown more attractive for upscale developers, the city leaders, they condemned and evicted nearly all the SROs downtown, those residential hotels where poor people lived. And even after those SROs were nearly all gone by the late 1960s, the major retailers that they were trying to attract, (laughs) shocker, they were still happier in San Francisco or Walnut Creek. All the energy and money and time that could have gone into improving Oakland for the people who actually lived here, was squandered, leaving empty lots and vacant buildings that lingered for years. One more example, and this was something that was actually proposed and could have happened. Instead of building greenway parks along the thriving creeks that wound their way down through the hills, they buried those creeks in concrete tunnels. In old Photos and paintings, you can see these creeks and they looked magnificent, like something you'd see in the Sierra. But now they're hidden underground. And, okay, stay with me here, because I know this intro is depressing, and I promise you the rest of the episode isn't all this much of a Debbie Downer. But what I'm getting at is, even though I love Oakland, it could look a lot different now. More equitable, more affordable housing, better public transportation, less violent, greener if the people in power had made different decisions. And I think it's important to understand how and why those decisions were made. Because looking back, you notice a lot of the same mistakes being made over and over again. When you take a step back and notice these cycles, these patterns, you realize that these bad decisions, these failures are bigger, much bigger than the individual politicians and business leaders who made them. Not to let those guys off the hook, but they were, for the most part, playing their role in a deeply flawed system that rewards greed and rewards racism, even when the outcomes benefit only a few while harming the vast majority. Okay, that might not be a newsflash to most people, but... It's important to zoom out sometimes and look at these issues from this systemic level because behind every pothole, every eviction, every parking space, every police scandal, every needle at the bottom of Lake Merritt, 
there's a web of policy decisions going back decades. And that web connects all of us. And we're also trapped in it. So, yeah. My guest today is Mitchell Schwarzer, a professor of architectural and urban history at the California College of the Arts. He's also the author of a brand new book called Hellatown, Oakland's History of Development and Disruption. And this book, Hellatown, it breaks down these patterns. Mitchell Schwarzer explains the history and the system, and some of the details that he dug up are astonishing. Like this one. In 1999, then mayor Jerry Brown said, quote, I already have affordable housing in Oakland. I want unaffordable housing. I'm just going to repeat that one more time. I already have affordable housing in Oakland. I want unaffordable housing. I think you all know what happened next. Like I was saying earlier, the problems that we're living with today, they didn't happen by accident. Okay, enough intro. Let's get to the interview. You're listening to East Bay Yesterday. I'm your host, Liam O'Donoghue. Stay tuned. And this is Brian Edwards Teeger, just using that music break to pop in with a quick fundraising appeal here. The book you're going to be hearing about this hour, Hellatown, Oakland's History of Development and Disruption, which is just out. Uh, we have just set up as a gift through our pledge system. You can pick it up for 150 bucks or $15 a month at kpfa.org. It's right there in the featured gift section or by calling 1-800-439-5732. And uh, we're going to start the clock right now on a challenge that has been put up by John and Laura, who are both in Oakland. If you pledge for the book, we will put that money towards matching their offer of one thousand dollars we can hit the thousand by the end of the hour we get to double it and that comes down to you 1-800-439-5732 1-800-HEY-KPFA save us the cost of the call and pledge at kpfa.org if you can pick it up Hellatown is yours for a pledge of 15 bucks a month let's go back to east bay yesterday I'm here on East Bay Yesterday today with Mitchell Schwarzer, the author of Hellatown, Oakland's History of Development and Disruption. And this book takes a real bird's eye view of the last century or so, a little bit longer, really, uh, of Oakland. And as opposed to focusing mostly on the the politicians or the activists that have been a part of this community for all those years this book really is more about patterns and trends in urban development and and policies and architecture commerce it's really a a high level look at why oakland looks the way that it does now and so this is a two-part question, I guess. Why did you write this book? It's so specific. It's so focused on Oakland. And obviously, I love that. But it's a very niche look at a city. And then why did you take that approach of looking at the kind of overall development patterns as opposed to you know, the history of mayors or something like that? So maybe to answer the second part first, um, it, it all relates to my background and my interests. So I uh, have a degree in city planning. And I uh, worked for the San Francisco... Department of City Planning in the early 1980s for, for several years. And then I went back and got a doctorate at MIT in history of architecture and urbanism. But then I moved back here in uh, the late 1995 to take a job at California College of the Arts. And ever since I've been back here, so I've been back here now 26 years, I've been, you know, getting involved much more in in the place I live, you know, writing about California architecture and California urbanism, cities and buildings, because that's my I've been interested in that since I was a kid. And so by natural extension, I started being much more interested in the place I am. And, And then alongside that, I started to notice that there isn't a lot written about Oakland. That one, you know, because I'm familiar with a lot of the literature on urban history, urban geography, 
And Oakland doesn't get mentioned a lot. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. It's a very interesting city, a unique city. And so I was like, hmm, there needs to be more attention to Oakland. So I started with a couple of articles I wrote about downtown in the, you know, the city center plan in the 1960s and 70s. I wrote about the evolution of Jack London Square. And then I wrote another piece about what's going on now with the kind of, you know, high rise residential development and the homelessness and housing problems. And you asked about why I focus more on urban built environment than on politics. Well, that's my area. So while politics is a part of the, a big part of the book and social relations are a big part, the focus is really on how did the physical environment come about? How did Oakland, the way we live it, the way we see it? The way we function in it, the way we relate to it. How did it all come about? What are the things that happened and what are the things that didn't happen? Because right. uh, that's also a big part of the book. Uh, and it, it extends across the range of, of areas from, you know, the transportation infrastructure to housing, to workplaces, to civic buildings, to parks, to shopping. Absolutely. Well, you already anticipated my next question, which is from your perspective, having dug into the history so deeply and so thoroughly. I mean, this book is a very comprehensive look at everything from transportation networks to the history of shopping malls and grocery stores in Oakland. I mean, you really look at the development from a lot of uh, major angles. What is it that makes Oakland unique? Well, I guess maybe the first thing would be that um, it's probably other than St. Paul, Minnesota, the most prominent second city in the United States. Okay, so we have to talk about what is the second city. You know, cities develop in irregular and complex ways. And usually in the early history of a city, uh, there are many centers that are competing to be the city, right? And that happens across the country. And in the Bay Area, that was certainly the case as well. San Francisco got an early lead because of the gold rush and because of San Francisco's location for uh, oceanic travel. And Oakland really is not a gold rush city. In fact, in 1860, Oakland had a population of less than 2,000 people, while San Francisco was over 100,000. You know, right. The gap was huge in 1860. And I think a big portion of those people were actually living up in the hills, uh, logging the old growth redwoods out of existence. Definitely. They were, they were, it was basically agriculture, logging, resource extraction, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't a big, it was a small port, a very small port. And uh, it really got its start with the Transcontinental Railway. And the development of, of West Oakland and Oakland Point as a transshipment center, right? From continental travel by land, by rail to, you know, sea travel. And Oakland was the kind of point of convergence of those two. And it becomes a second city. It, it, it grows dramatically from, you know, the 1870s onward. I think it's the second largest California city by 1880. And it remains that until the very beginning of the 20th. 20th century when Los Angeles overtakes it. And then all through the 20th century, you know, up to the 1970s or maybe even longer, Oakland still is doing well for much of the 20th century. It's still growing a lot. It is increasing population. Oakland has an attitude, and by Oakland, I mean the, the kind of movers and shakers of Oakland, the business leaders, the political leaders, the ones who are making things happen in terms of development, they have this feeling that Oakland should be the largest city in California. And it's abetted by certain events like the 1906 earthquake when a lot of San Franciscans relocate here. Absolutely. I was going to just jump in real quick to mention, I remember reading a newspaper opinion column right around that time. I think it was about 1910 when the Oakland boosters were trying to really convince business to move from San Francisco to Oakland instead of rebuilding in the city. And one of these columns predicted that Oakland would become the Manhattan to San Francisco's Brooklyn. Oh, totally. I mean, they, there's this, you can read it in many, especially if you read Chamber of Commerce, their annual reports and publications. There's this feeling that, okay, Oakland is on the continental side of the bay. It has great rail links. It has good road links to the rest of the country. San Francisco is isolated on its peninsula. Oakland has more flat land than San Francisco. Oakland has a better climate than San Francisco. So for, for a variety of reasons, there's this feeling Oakland should be the, the dominant metropolis. And so 
because of the railroad in the in the 19th century and then the earthquake in the early 20th century and then the growth of Oakland through industry the first world war really jump starts Oakland industry Oakland becomes the industrial center of the bay area well there's a feeling well Given all these factors, we're growing, we've got all this new industry, a lot of San Franciscans have moved here, the future is ours. The population of Oakland was doubling almost every decade or two from essentially the time Oakland was founded up until about, what, the 1930s or so, early 1940s maybe? Oakland grows until 1950. Yeah. You know, the 40s were another big growth period because of the war industries, right? But then we've kind of been stuck at like 400,000, 500,000 in that range ever since then. Yeah, we went, I think the the, the population crested a little over 400,000 by 1950, and then it kind of hovered. And it went a little. It went up and down. It didn't grow much. It didn't lose much. Which is kind of an anomaly because at the same time, California as a state is just booming. I mean, the population of California doubled or maybe even tripled during the following half century, while Oakland's population remained relatively stagnant. It remained stagnant, relatively stagnant. But if you look at the last census, which is fascinating, Oakland grew by fifty thousand people between twenty ten and twenty twenty. We now have four hundred forty one thousand people, roughly. And we were at 391 in the last census. So there's a big population. This is the biggest increase since the 40s mm. in the 2010s. So there is this interesting uh, shift uh, when we can talk about where that where they live and what happened. But um, there was this competition all along and this feeling we, we have to outdo San Francisco, which was good and bad. Because it led to a lot of striving and a lot of plans and a lot of ambition. You know, you see it, for instance, in the sports teams, right? In the 1960s, Oakland miraculously, for a city of roughly 400,000 people, you know, we gained four major league teams. It started with the um, Raiders, followed by the Oakland Athletics. They relocated from Kansas City to Oakland, followed by the Warriors, the Golden State Warriors, that came to Oakland eventually by the late 60s. Uh, and they, there was even an NHL team. For the one. Seals. The Seals. <laughs> so, I mean, you cannot come up with another mid-sized American city that had four major, you know, all four major league sports teams. San Francisco never did. Mm. Had four at the same time, you know. I'm, and they were proud of that. Like, we have bested San Francisco. Right. And at the same time, we also, uh, Oakland became the, the main port. Yeah. You know, up until the 1960s, the early 60s, San Francisco was really the, the primary port of the Bay Area. And with containerization, which Oakland jumped on and was an innovator in, and probably one of, that's one of the great stories of Oakland, is the development of the container port during the 1960s. When Oakland became briefly, by the late 60s, the second largest container port in the world, you know, which is extraordinary. And ever since then has been a major container port. Yeah. And San Francisco, because of its site right it didn't have the it didn't landfill the way oakland did into the bay you know and it didn't have the highway links and the rail links and you need all that for containerization you need large areas to store the containers and you need trucking access for the trucks to come in and it it was disadvantageous for san francisco right. oakland grabbed onto it and became this major container board so i think the sports teams and the containerization in the 60s oakland was like whoa we are really moving forward. And yet at this exact same moment, Oakland is falling apart in a lot of ways. That's what we call foreshadowing. You're listening to East Bay Yesterday on KPFA. The guest on today's show is Mitchell Schwarzer, who's just published a book called Helitown, Oakland's History of Development and Disruption. Um, it's a really impressive sweeping history that gets into everything from how most of the city's neighborhoods got built around streetcar lines. Uh, the, the biggest building boom was in the 1920s in the city's history. Uh, why Oakland doesn't have a big central park and the kind of impressively terrible political <laughs> decisions that went into that. Um, why Oakland got more carved up by freeways than any other city in the Bay Area during the era of freeway construction uh, and why they blasted through the neighborhoods that they did. We're featuring it as a thank you gift during the show. It is yours for a pledge of 15 bucks a month if you become a KPFA sustainer or $150 all at once at 1-800-439-5732. And if you make the pledge right now, you will be helping us 
a lot. Um, two of your fellow listeners, John and Laura in Oakland, have put up a thousand dollar challenge out of their own pockets for East Bay yesterday. They're willing to double a thousand if we can raise a thousand. So far, we have raised one hundred and fifty. We're looking for you to join the person who made that brave first pledge. 1 800 439 5732. 1 800 Hey KPFA. Just 90 seconds till we go back to the show, Liam. Brian, uh, you know, I'm so glad that we're offering this book, Hellatown by Mitchell Schwarzer, as a fundraiser gift for anybody that calls in now at uh, 1-800-439-5732 to uh, support KPFA. And the reason I think it's so appropriate is because this book is about the importance of, you know, public policy infrastructure to create a functioning city. And a big part of that ecosystem that we need to survive as a city, as a state, as a country is media, specifically independent media. And KPFA is just a key part of that equation. Um, You know, we need to have journalists like the people at KPFA talking about what's happening behind closed doors at city halls and in these planning meetings. And a lot of the news that you're getting from KPFA, you simply will not hear anywhere else. You will not hear the kind of analysis and insight that you hear on KPFA at some of these other corporate run media. So if you enjoy hearing what you get from KPFA and you want to hear more of it, you need to support the station. Once again, we do have a $1,000 matching grant right now, uh, matching challenge. (laughs) Shout out to the listeners who put that up and we're running out of time. I know you guys want to hear the rest of this interview. So We'll tune back into that in a second here, but I just want to remind you, KPFA is not free. It takes a lot of money to run this operation, and if you like what you're hearing, we're going to need your support. Once again, the number is 1-800-439-5732, or you can also donate online at kpfa.org. Once again, a donation of $150 gets the book, Helaton by Mitchell Schwarzer, who you're hearing right now, this hour on East Bay Yesterday. All right, now the sirens have passed, so let's get back to it. You're describing this buildup, all this uh, excitement, this energy, the rise of industry, the sports teams, high hopes for Oakland. What happened? Why didn't these predictions of Oakland becoming the next major metropolis of the West Coast necessarily come true? I mean, I mean that's a big part, big story within the book and, and something we really, Oakland has really had a hard time grappling with. Um, a lot of things happen. One is that I, I like to call the 60s and 70s the period when Oakland is kind of a Rust Belt city in the Sun Belt. In other words, it starts to bifurcate. And Oakland starts to become a very divided city. And to talk about that, you have to start talking about demographics. Up until 1940, thereabouts, Oakland was largely white. Uh, We're talking from the late 19th century up until the 1940s. It's largely a, a city composed of white people. At some point, like over, well, over 90%. You know, the black population in 1940 is under 3%. And the Asian and Latino populations are similarly small. It always had different populations, but they were never that large, right? The black population after 1940 grows exponentially. It grows from in 1940 from under 3% to 1980, 40 years later, it's approaching 50%. And it's the largest single group. They're the plurality in Oakland. There's this enormous migration of blacks from the western part of the American South from Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, to California, and mainly to Oakland, Los Angeles, Richmond, San Francisco, the places in California where there's a lot of industrial development related to the Second World War. The jobs. The jobs. There are a lot of jobs in Oakland, shipyards, factories, and naturally people start coming for those jobs. So Oakland's demographics changed dramatically starting in the 40s. The jobs don't last. And this is one of the, you know, the the industrial boom of Oakland, which really, I would say, it really takes off in the teens during the First World War, and it starts to collapse in the 1960s. So you have about a 50-year period where Oakland is this industrial giant, you know, of the Pacific, second only to Los Angeles. Right, and we're talking 
auto manufacturers, shipyards, uh, electronics plants, canning. You, you go through it all in the book. It's an amazing overview exactly. of how many industries Everything located to Oakland. Made in Oakland almost. Yeah. Oakland was this, you know, and this is the case, you know, this is, it's kind of mirrors a lot of Midwestern cities and Eastern cities, Philadelphia, Detroit, St. Louis. They're all having, these are all industrial powerhouses during that same period. America, this is America, right? Pre-globalization. This is pre-globalization. And pre-suburbanization, really, in, in a lot of parts, like Alameda County. Right. It, the, the industry is happening in Oakland, not in the suburbs of Oakland. So what starts to happen are a couple of things, and you just indicated one of them is suburbanization. It starts with, the first collapse in industry is the shipyards. The shipyards really function well on the West Coast during wartime and not during peacetime. So after the Second World War, the shipyards in Oakland and uh, Alameda start to downsize and eventually shut down. They're all gone pretty much by 1960. The second big, big casualty is auto assembly. We had Several auto assembly plants in Oakland, two run by General Motors, one by uh, Fajil Motors, uh, and there were lo lots of smaller ones and lots of associated auto uh, production outlets. One of Oakland's many nicknames uh, back in the day was the Detroit, Detroit of the of West, the, right? Exactly, the Detroit of the West. Well, the, the Detroit of the West is gone by 1963. It's really remarkably rapid. From 1960 to 63, it all falls apart. What happens is the plants move. And GM relocates down to where Tesla is now in Fremont. Why do they relocate there? Rel rel relocate there for the same reason that Ford left Richmond and went to Milpitas a little bit earlier. They want land. They want big areas of land. They want a new plant, horizontally uh, structured plant. So they go from a small plant, which is now Eastmont Center. That's where the old, the main GM plant was. There was another one, another large one on um, International Boulevard at the San Leandro line. They close those plants because they're constricted. There isn't a lot of land. And they go out to Fremont where they have a lot of land because this is all based now on the you know re reorganization of society due to the automobile and trucking. You know? So you don't want st factories with multiple stories. It's hard to move up and down those with vehicles. So you want one level plants up to date with lots of land. And so there's a suburbanization of industry that really starts accelerating ar around that time in 1960. And from 1960 to the 1990s, all the industries you mentioned leave. The canneries all close. Why do the canneries close? Well, they close for a different reasons. A lot of the Orchards and uh, farms that supply the tomatoes and the apricots, they have to close because they're replaced by housing and, and shopping centers in places like Hayward and San Lorenzo and then other parts of Alameda County. So they're gone. They're in the Central Valley now. So it makes sense for the canneries to be located near where the produce is grown. So they relocate to the Central Valley. So the canneries close. The electronics plants close. They relocate because there's a centralization of electronics industry, both in the Midwest and then eventually overseas. So a whole set of globally determined developments alongside suburbanization lead to industrial collapse in Oakland. And so for the new migrants, the black migrants who've arrived in Oakland and starting in the 40s, it's disastrous. Right, because unlike the white workers who can move to Milpitas or Fremont to follow those jobs due to housing restrictions, housing discrimination, the black workers can't chase those factories south. They can't at all. They, they, won, they can't live in the suburbs. They're prohibited living from living in the suburbs by racial exclusionary ordinances. You know, I think San Leandro in, in the 50s and 60s is like 1% black or under. And the same goes for most of the suburbs nearby. So blacks are pretty much con constrained to Oakland itself. So they can And then the highways, you know, to get down to those new jobs and the BART, which is built in, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s, really doesn't facilitate in going out to those jobs. It facilitates getting people from the suburbs in to San Francisco. And that's a whole nother story that we can talk about. So, yeah, the, you have this bad situation for ha almost half of the Oakland population. And this applies as well to the smaller Asian and Latino populations in Oakland, where they really, the, the, the jobs that people depended on are vanishing, right, right? right? So during the early 40s, it's great for the new blacks who arrived because there's, it's called the Great Compression. You know, it's this period when there's so many jobs 
that people who are normally on the bottom of the employment ladder do well. But as soon as the war ends, that starts to change. Right. Last hired, first fired, I believe, is the, the concise phrase to sum that it's up. It's true. And there is a little recovery in the 50s, but with a real larger collapse from the 60s to the 90s, culminating in the military bases all closing, which right. had a lot of black employment. Right. right. Oakland had three major military bases, the Naval Hospital in the Hills, the Naval Supply Center, and the Oakland Army Base by the in what is now the Oakland port. They all close in the in the 90s. So the employment picture goes from being decent to being catastrophic for lower income people in Oakland. And this is completely tied to the rise of Oak crime in Oakland from this it starts if you look at crime statistics in Oakland, they're not that alarming in 1960 and from 70 onward they're alarming. Mm -hmm. You know, murder yeah. rates go way up. And this is large, you know, this it, it cannot be separated from the lack of jobs. And it's also the case that in Oakland and elsewhere in the Bay Area, blacks were prevented from kind of getting the jobs that other people could get. They couldn't get jobs with BART. It mm. took a long time. There were a lot of protests. They couldn't get jobs with the city of Oakland, with the police department, with restaurants, with major businesses. They were pretty much kept out of the good job market. Right, of course. And I mean, there's the famous... Uh even protests at grocery stores, places yes. like Safeway, yes. where they were uh, civil rights uh, leaders were were demonstrating against the fact that it wasn't only you know white collar jobs or government jobs that people of color were locked out of, but even entry level uh, service sector jobs. And it's beyond even jobs with Safeway. Safeway is a very it's a sad story in a lot of ways. It was headquartered in Oakland. You know, it was one of the largest grocery chains in the United States and very innovative. And based in Oakland from the 30s all the way to the 90s for 60 years. And yet Safeway, during the latter part of the 20th century, consolidated. They kept building bigger stores and had fewer stores. So they kept closing the smaller, older stores and building new, larger stores. And what happened is over time, they kept closing pretty much every store in the flatlands that served the minority communities. And if you look today, I think there are six Safeway stores left in Oakland. All of them are in the lower hills or the upper hills. None of them are in the flatlands. The the um, flagship Safeway in Oakland was at uh, on Broadway. By, it's where the grocery outlet is now. Shout out to Gross Out. It, that's where the and and that was a marina style Safeway, beautiful design, you know, and it closed by the late 90s. Yeah. So Oakland, the say a company that was based in Oakland basically abandoned half the population. And so this all speaks to this bifurcation of the city that's going on in this period. You have basically half the city or more not being served by jobs, not being served by supermarkets. So there's the, the, the beginning of food deserts in Oakland where people don't have access to food nearby. They, you know, they have to go to the little corner groceries, which mainly sell liquor and high priced food. So Oakland starts to be a city that isn't really benefiting half of its people. Liam, did you just call grocery outlet gross out? <laughs> Liam O'Donoghue, the host of East Bay yesterday, is right now scrambling to find his unmute button. Uh, I'm Brian Edwards Teeker. We, we have just uh, two minutes at this break in this edition of East Bay yesterday to try to encourage you to pledge to the KPFA and keep this kind of stuff on the air. Um, if you value like the connection to local history and the in-depth plumbing of how the place we live got to be the way we experience it, you're not going to find too many places it Getting that kind of work to a mass audience with commercial sponsorship. And if you value it, we need to hear from you because we are in a situation. Um, at the start of this program, two of our supporters in Oakland put up a really big challenge for the middle of the afternoon. They offered to double a thousand if we could raise a thousand to match them on East Bay yesterday. So far, we have raised a grand total of just a hundred and fifty. We only have 25 minutes left on the clock and more of the program to bring you in that time. Um, there's like no time for do-overs or recoveries or turnarounds. It is now or never. So if you have been holding back, if you have been biding your time, this is your radio station's hour of need. Help us make this $1,000 challenge and show your support for the work that Liam does every week here on East Bay Yesterday. 
Hey KPFA or kpfa.org. Uh, a pledge in any amount will uh, make you a KPFA member if it's more than 25 bucks. If you can get that pledge up to 15 bucks a month or 150 all at once, we would love to give you Mitchell Swarzer's brand new book in hardcover, Helitown, Oakland's History of Development and Disruption. I think there's only like one other book devoted to the, the history of 20th century Oakland, uh, Robert O'Self's American Babylon, which is stunning given what an incredible impact this city has had. Um, and, and if you're glad to see it getting explored seriously between the covers and on the airwaves, then show that support right now. One caller on the line, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or kpfa.org. Liam, we got 90 seconds left. Well, <laughs> before we go back, Brian, I just want to, point out that there is more than one book about 20th century Oakland history. Uh, no There There by Chris Romberg is another crucial oh, text, yeah. as well as Oakland, The Story of a City by Beth Bagwell. Um, those, those uh, along with American Babylon and Helitown, are, are four of my top picks. Of course, there are others that are focused on other specific histories of uh, different eras of Oakland history. I mean, I have an entire shelf of uh, books, for example, devoted to the Black Panthers and the rise of the Black Black uh, power movement, black uh, you know liberation movements, in uh, the 1960s and 70s. So there's there's a deep catalog, but those are those are some of the greatest hits. Um, and for anyone who is building your own library, though, of Oakland history, of East Bay, of Bay Area history, this book by Mitchell Schwarz or Helitown is a crucial crucial addition that you will that you'll need if you really want to kind of put all the pieces together because it's an incredible overview that really answers a lot of the questions raised by some of these other books and once again you can book you can get that book right now for a hundred and fifty dollar donation to KPFA you can support us during this fundraiser once again the number is one eight hundred. Hey KPFA, or you can donate online at kpfa.org. Uh, the number is 800-439-5732. And we got to get to that $1,000. We've only got about a minute left in this break. And then we'll be getting back to my interview with Mitchell Schwarzer. So now is the time. Don't make us wait until the last minute and freak out. Brian, this always happens to us where we've got one minute left and we're like $100 short and we're just, you know, dying on air because we're so stressed out about if we're going to make the goal or not. Take it easy on us today, folks. As a gift to Brian and I today, call in and make your donation right now. It would make us so happy and relaxed for the rest of this hour. And uh, yeah, the, the ball's in your court, folks. If you're listening to KPFA right now, if you want to make that donation, now is the time to do it. 1-800-439-5732. What do you think, Brian? Should we get back to the interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After I tell them that they can also pledge at kpfa.org, uh, where we do not have to pay fees to the call center that we've been using to handle calls in a pandemic-safe manner. So kpfa.org and uh, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Liam, an update on the count. Uh, thanks to pledges from Laytonville, Pacific Grove, and Devin in Livermore, who specifically shouted out your program, among others. Uh, we are now at $450 left to raise to make our challenge. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. Back to East Bay yesterday. I know in the book, one theme that you keep coming back to again and again, and you trace a lot of these kind of social ills to, is the rise of the automobile. And... Before we get into some of the the trends that you analyze in the book regarding uh, the rise of car culture, I want to talk for a second about how you begin your chapter about cars because I love you have an anecdote. Somehow you figured out who Oakland's very first car owner was, and it was a doctor who had a steam-powered car, which I didn't even really know that was a thing. But I love this quote that you have about how replacing tires was easier than shoeing a stallion uh describing this transition from doctors who would ride you know ponies and horses to their appointment uh you know changing to the the, the steam powered cars cutting edge technology at the time so um i want to ask 
how you discovered who Oakland's first car owner was and uh, how bad do you think the potholes were back then before we get into sort of these bigger social issues of the impact that cars had on Oakland? Uh, I found it through, I think it was, you know, I went through the Oakland Tribune and the Oakland Post, you know, the newspapers extensively. For you really found like patient zero though. Yeah, and I found him and I was like this, you know, this guy and, and doctors were wealthier and they needed, you know, they needed to get around town. So he was one of the, it's kind of like, you know, a, a new, when a new technology comes into being, it, it often manifests itself within a certain sector of society. Like televisions didn't first appear in people's homes. They first appeared in public places like bars where you, people would watch them in a communal place and eventually get them in the home. A lot of uh, technological improvements, are like a lot of them come out of hotels, air mm. conditioning. Mm. You know, people at first experienced air conditioning in hotels and then, oh, we want it in our home. So and cars were kind of like that. They didn't first appear for the general market. They appeared for a certain segment of the market. And then people saw others riding around them like, oh, this is kind of great. And, you know, the gasoline powered car triumphed by the early 20th century. The second part of that question is just kind of a joke, but I'm just thinking, you know, looking at how bad Oakland's potholes are now, oh, yeah. I can only imagine. I feel like we probably still have some potholes from back then that haven't been repaired yet. Well, I mean, you have to remember, remember back then, most of the streets of Oakland were not macadamized. They weren't laid out in concrete or gra or asphalt, right? There were a lot of dirt streets in Oakland. So the potholes were even, you know, there was not just potholes, but mud. Yeah, good luck getting around in the rainy season. Right, and horse manure and all sorts of, you know, garbage. Was, it, the street environment is better today than it was 125 years ago. But the potholes have become kind of, and even driving from my house in Grand Lake to your house here, I, I encountered many potholes. Yeah, if anyone in uh, City Hall is listening to this episode, 27th, please. We've got quite a few potholes on that one. It'd be great to uh, get those filled in. Um, you know, there's another great quote I love from the book where you mentioned the fact that, quote, land use and building patterns are a puzzle that can only be deciphered by going back in time. So let's talk about some of those puzzle pieces that you put together in this book here and the connection between those land use patterns and these different transportation networks, because you really take it from the key system and streetcars up through AC Transit, BART, cars, etc. Talk a little bit about that. How do you see this relationship between the evolution of different transportation networks and how land is used in a place like Oakland? And I, I like to actually end with Zoom because I think Zoom is part of that. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it's I've only realized that it's during the pandemic, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll connect it to that. Before streetcars, right? And so streetcars are really invented in the late 1880s and really become widespread in the 1890s. You know, it wasn't that easy to get around. It took a long time. You know, you're basically traveling either by foot or by horse. And what streetcars do is increase the, the, the speed of travel by roughly threefold. So you can travel three times as fast as you did earlier. And what that means, and you can carry stuff right on them too. And so what streetcars do is they extend the city horizontally. They allow people to commute from longer distances to, to other parts of the metropolis. So the streetcar city, which emerges in the 1890s and continues all, it's operative until almost the set, you know, roughly the second world war era. The streetcar city extends the city horizontally across all the way. You know, you could also go up into the hills because before streetcars, horse drawn vehicles have a very hard time going up and down hills. You can imagine where streetcars are, are much better at that. And since Oakland is comprised of three zones, right, the flatlands, the lower hills and then the very steep upper hills, the lower hills start getting developed with streetcars. And that's the early 20th century. And even the. Slightly steeper neighborhoods as streetcars couldn't get to the developers who were working hand in hand with the streetcar lines. They uh, built the quote unquote secret stairways as they're known now, but basically staircases to serve these residential neighborhoods that are still wonderful walking paths. Yeah, they built this the the uh, the stairwalks because people didn't want to walk too far to the streetcar. And if they didn't want to walk far, that means the land wasn't as valuable. So how do you increase the value of land closer to a streetcar line if, it's, if, if there's a big hill in between? Well, if you create a walkway, 
then you you allow people to walk more easily to the streetcar. The land is more valuable. They can sell it for more money. And that's the name of the game. I didn't even really, I wasn't aware of this until I read your book, but you talk about how the key system, this electric streetcar system, wasn't even really designed to be profitable. It was more about making the land that the streetcars serve profitable because the same people who own the streetcar were speculating on this real estate. Totally. The streetcars were laid out to facilitate land development and land sales. Mm -hmm. They were not laid out at kind of in a kind of thoughtful manner. Well, this area should have transportation, this area should. In fact, there were lots of duplicate lines at first. So it was a kind of, it was a private sector affair. It was a money-making thing, but it's actually what led to the development of much of Oakland, the streetcar era. And automobiles were the same thing afterwards, right? The, the colonization and development of the upper hills, which really occurs more after the Second World War, is by automobile. And it's the same thing, you know, lay out roads, widen roads, develop new freeways and access points, and you can get to places quicker, right? Okay. So there's this history of from streetcars and then to automobiles and freeways of expanding the metropolis, right? Cr basically creating new land for development for profit. So that's a big part of it. What's also attendant to that, though, is I, I think, it, and this is contrary to what we, t I think, what, especially in the Bay Area, which is so technophilic, we let, you know, we think every new technology is going to just be fantastic and it's going to result in new ways of living and new apps and, and the like. Well, what often happens with the new technology is that it actually worsens social stratification. And by that, I mean that up until the streetcar era, most people in Oakland lived downtown or very close to downtown. They lived in the West Oakland and they lived east of the lake, but they lived in a kind of core area. And the downtown up until the streetcar era was mixed use. It had everything. It had religious buildings. It had industry. It had residences. It had stores. It had everything. Some beautiful theaters. Beautiful. A lot of theaters. They were up, I think there were between 20 and 30 theaters at one point downtown alone. That many. So down, it, it, it was a multi-use district. What happens with streetcar Oakland? It develops Oakland horizontally, but it also develops downtown vertically, right? So the downtown starts going up in density. You have the development of the office building. Often, you know, up until uh, the early 20th century, the tallest structures in Oakland were church spires. Afterward, they become office buildings, right? And so this, the new downtown is now much more homogeneous, Resident industry moves out. They move out to larger parcels along the estuary and the waterfront where the rail lines are and the water transport means. And then that's followed by residences. Residents start moving out along the streetcar lines. They move to North Oakland, the upper, the lower hills, all through East Oakland. So basically what you get in Oakland after the streetcar from the early 20th century is a commercial downtown, a commercial downtown of office buildings, Department stores, movie theaters, ballrooms, produce markets, hotels, a new type of downtown, but really geared exclusively around commerce. Mm -hmm. And residence becomes afterthoughts now, right? Mm -hmm. They're located elsewhere. That's the kind of downtown that people are trying to reverse now, right? Yeah. Starting in the late 20th century. We need a multi-use downtown because this old model of a commercial downtown isn't working at, at well, all. Because a lot of those office workers don't stay around downtown after they clock out at the end of the day. They're going up to the hills or out to the suburbs. And so, I mean, I remember walking around downtown Oakland 20 years ago and it was incredibly quiet at night. You could walk around blocks and blocks of downtown Oakland not even bump into... A single person. And even the financial district in San Francisco is like that. And lower Manhattan is like that. It's, it's a characteristic of downtowns across the country that when they became homogeneously commercial, they only operated dur when the, during the time office workers were there. And that brings us, that'll bring us to the Zoom phenomenon. But before going to there, I just want to point out. So when you had the streetcar expansion of Oakland and then you had the automobile expansion of Oakland. So when Oakland expands along streetcar lines and then roads and then freeways, what it does is it allows wealthier people who have the means to move out further and to live among people that they want to live among. So it encourages racial and, and class stratification. We don't want to live near stores. Because a lot of the best residential suburbs in Oakland are free of stores. We don't want to live near industry, even though we're the ones who own industry and profit from it. 
And we don't want to live around along minorities because of America's racial climate. We want to live in exclusively white neighborhoods. So we're going to create covenants to prevent people of color, primarily African, people of African, Latino descent, and Asian descent. We're going to prevent them from moving to our neighborhoods. Well, that was made possible in a way by the technology. The technology didn't say explicitly, okay, we're going to, it's going to happen. But the technology enabled systemic racist attitudes to function. Listening to East Bay yesterday, an interview with Mitchell Schwarzer. Professor of Architectural and Urban History at California College of the Arts, Oakland and San Francisco, who has just put out the stunning new book, Helitown, Oakland's History of Development and Disruption. That is our featured thank you gift for the minutes that we have left in this hour. It is yours for a pledge of 15 bucks a month as a KPFA sustainer or 150 all at once at 1-800-439-5732. one 800 Hey, KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. Um, I want to give a shout out to everyone who's been showing up for KPFA over the past few minutes. Barbara in Mill Valley, Victoria in San Francisco, Roberta in Sebastopol, Nancy in San Francisco, Jenny in Oakland. I believe Jenny was the pledge that took us over the top on yes. our challenge. But there was... Another pledge that came through that I have not discussed yet, because no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, James oh, here we go. Offered to up the ante and take the challenge from one thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars, which we need just three hundred and forty more to match. One eight hundred four three nine five seven three two one eight hundred Hey KPFA. The website is kpfa dot org. The phone number one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. It's now fifteen hundred dollars on the line for your radio station, and it's your last chance to show your support for East Bay. Yesterday, one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. If you need to remember it, one eight hundred Hey KPFA. Or save us the cost of the call at kpfa.org. Liam? Brian, uh, that is going to be a tight squeeze to get to 1500 but I think we can do it. I'm just going to take a second to give the listeners a little look behind the curtain of how I make East Bay yesterday. Just to give you guys an idea of what goes into making this show. Since the pandemic started, uh, I've been trying to err on the safe side, and I've been doing most of my interviews outdoors. Uh, specifically, I've interviewed quite a few people, including the interview uh, that you just heard with Mitchell Schwarzer in my backyard at my place in Oakland. So sometimes in the background of these interviews, you will hear noises, you will hear trucks, you will hear sirens. But uh, on a more lovely note, you will also hear birds because I do have a couple trees in my backyard. And the listener, Jenny, who put us over the top of that thousand dollar challenge was none other than the renowned local author, Jenny O'Dell, uh, author and artist uh, behind uh, the blockbuster book, How to Do Nothing. And when Jenny texted me to let me know that she was making that pledge to KPFA, not only did she uh, let me know that she was donating to KPFA, but she also correctly identified the sound of a California towhee that was uh, <laughs> quietly chirping in the background of that interview with Mitchell Schwarzer that you just heard. So, folks, all that is to say, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jenny. Second of all, this is a totally, you know, DIY operation here. Uh, I'm doing these interviews, you know, not on the, you know, top of some penthouse uh, skyscraper in downtown financial district, San Francisco, etc. You know, uh, this is like put together with uh, duct tape and uh, chewing gum sometimes in my backyard and that means that literally every single dollar counts. When you donate to KPFA, your money is um, really uh, helping keep the station on the air, helping uh, pay the staff, helping to cover the costs of running the transmitter so we can cover so much of Central and Northern California with the signal as well as running the uh, 
costs of the, you know, the hosting for the internet so people can tune in from around the world. And we know people are tuning in from around the world because we get donations from all over the planet. Um, so if you are one of those many, many people tuned into KPFA right now, whether it's on the air or through the website, please, we've got about another four minutes to make this new challenge, $1,500. And uh, the number that you can call is one 800 Four three nine five seven three two, or you can donate online at kpfa.org. And once again, the one hundred and fifty dollar donation will get you the Hellatown book, an interview, uh, the the with a uh, the book written by the author of the interview you just heard. But you don't need to donate one hundred and fifty dollars if that's out of your budget. We'll take five dollars. We'll take ten dollars. We'll take twenty dollars. Whatever you can chip in to help us reach that matching challenge, we are grateful for. And we're grateful for all the listeners. So, folks, if you're out there right now and you're on the fence, we've only got about three minutes left at this point. Now is the time to make the call. Brian, what do you think? Are we getting close? I think, you know, if it was a California Tohi that got Jenny O'Dell to give, then we have to call in the troops. We have to call in the big guns. We have to bring in the city of Oakland's official bird. We have to bring in the call of the black crowned knight heron. We are now one hundred and sixty five dollars away from making that expanded fifteen hundred dollar challenge. And we're in our final two minutes to get it done. So join that black crowned night heron and help out your community radio station. 1-800-439-5732. I think I learned today what it means to be a community radio station. It means your donors are calling the people who are on your airwaves to say, I recognize the local bird that was recorded in the background of your backyard interview. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at www.kpfa.org. Again, the book is Mitchell Schwarzer's Hellatown, Oakland's History of Development and Disruption. I mean, folks, where else are you going to hear content like this? Uh, East Bay yesterday, it's about as local as it gets, and I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without the support of KPFA. Please call now, 1-800-439-5732, or donate to 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Uh, you're, you're doing East Bay yesterday a favor, you're doing KPFA a favor, and you're doing a favor to all the folks out there who uh, are listeners and uh, really enjoy hearing all about the local history of the place that they live. Brian, what do you think? We, I know we got to wind it down. Are we going to hit that number? It was an anonymous donation from Mighty Elsa Bronte that took us over the top on that $1,500 hey. challenge. Thank you so much to everyone who pledged. Please keep pledging at kpfa.org. Bobby Seal. And Huey says, nope, nope, nope. It's not necessary for you to leave. We're a new organization. We're here to observe the police. We've already checked the law out. And all of you as citizens also have a right to stand and observe these police. They're brutalizing our people in the community, et cetera, et cetera, and so on, so on, so on. So please, everybody, do not leave. Stay here. We're a very disciplined organization. And this cop had got out of his car standing there and listening to Huey with his back to the cop tell these people this and the cop you have no right to observe me and he would turn around and says no according to such and such a california state supreme court ruling every citizen has the right to stand and observe a police officer as long as they stand a reasonable distance away and that particular rule and reasonable distance constituted is eight to ten feet i'm standing approximately 20 feet from you and i'll observe you whether you like it or not and some sister in the audience she say well go ahead on and tell it brother storytelling for social change on KPFA. Toni Morrison was born in Ohio in 1931. She was an African-American novelist who became the first African-American woman 
to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature. She is celebrated for her novels written about African Americans from a Black perspective, what she called the Black gaze. Ms. Morrison showed how devastating and destructive racism can be through its efforts on the characters in her books. The beauty of her prose and depth of her understanding can provide deep insight for those willing to see. This has been a profile in Black Excellence for Black History Month. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K24ABR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org.